Thank you for coming to this uh, panel discussions, discussions on development and gentrification in the U District, but of course we see that everywhere in our region. Uh, my name is Clifford Cawthon. I'm a professor over at Bellevue College and also a member of Seattle Renters Commission, as well as um, a writer at Outs ah, excuse me, a writer with Outside City Hall um, and a few other outlets, not to mention the chair of the Tenth Union Board of Directors. So housing development is kind of my personal jam, so to speak. But also, it's the development housing is something that all of our amazing panelists uh, know well about. So we have Peter, Mr. Peter Steinbrook, one of the port commissioners and former city council members, and he also uh, runs Urban Strategies Consulting. He's going to present his results of um, a survey of small businesses and their needs in the U District, as well as a number of other interesting factoids. There's Rick Mid ah, McLaughlin, excuse me, a big time brewery and ale house, which uh, F FYI, excellent beer, excellent. Um, you know, and leader of the U District Small Business Association. This is going to talk about some of the challenges they've faced and also their successful organizing efforts around uh, mitigating some of the inequities um, relating to zoning process uh, that we're currently seeing unfold, as well as Mr. Chris Peterson uh, to his left. Um, so he's the owner of Allegro Coffee House, excellent coffee. Give me, give me a, uni give me a universal pass. No, I'm um, So it was founded in 1975, and it's one of the longest running and one of the strongest coffee houses in the entire city. And he's a key player here in the U District. And last but certainly not least, Council Member Lisa Herbold of District One, my former council member, and uh, she has led the charge on a number of equitable development equitable bleh, development initiatives as well as a lot of amazing work on workers rights as well as advocacy when it comes to housing and most of the progressive legislation that we've seen come down the pipeline um, from Seattle City Council in the last what was it two years man time flies I know I remember when you first ran it's crazy yeah so it, right on right on and uh, we have a new guest. This is when life throws me a little bit of a curveball. Yes, remind me. Yes, and uh, Miss Gail Nowicki from the University District uh, Small, of course, from the U University District Small Business Association. I believe was it the chair or president? The chair or president? Chair or president of the association? Um, chair. chair. Sorry, uh, chair of the University District Small Business Association. Sorry, a lot of different committees, a lot of different panels, a lot of different titles. So, um, just so you know how this is going to uh, proceed forward. Oh, and last but not least, um, the bathrooms, and this is very important, so you should all understand this. The bathrooms are through that door, follow the signs, and in fact, you are going to do kind of a reverse P. So yes, you'll want to follow the signs, and they're kind of clearly marked uh, for women and men, and they the path diverges kind of like a fork. So uh, just ask anyone at the uh, exits if you have any questions or you know, need to be directed towards the bathrooms. Now, um, the subject that we're going to be uh, dwelling on tonight is can the Ave in all of Seattle's uh, neighborhood small businesses uh, survive upzoning, runaway growth, growth, inequitable development, as well as, of course, that big G in the room, gentrification, right? Um, so the challenges facing small businesses, facing renters, facing low-income um, homeowners are going to be the crux of tonight's discussion, and hopefully you will leave here um, a bit bit better informed about some of the things that are being done and some of the things that can be done around displacement. So, without further ado, I can go on and talk for another three minutes, but as my students know, that's usually not really that fun. Um, so, in that case, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Peter Steinbrook, and, uh, oh, last but not least, a little shout out, just so folks know. This is, of course, being sponsored by the, oh, 
not that, being sponsored by the Seattle uh, D uh, Displacement Coalition. And if you've not checked out Outside City Hall, which is the news blog that Seattle, Dis the Seattle Displacement Coalition, that's been in uh, formation since 1977 and originally responded to displacement that was happening on Capitol Hill after the uh, Boeing bust and has been reporting and intervening in um, anti, well, in displacement struggles since the 70s. If you want to learn more information, if you want to see some of the work that's being done, there's a sign-in sheet back there before Outside City Hall, which is a news blog, as well as the Seattle Displacement Co Coalition if you want to get involved. So thank you all for coming. This is a great turnout. Thank you, KUOW, for the plug this morning. And there was a really interesting story. Some of the um, uh, people who were interviewed are here today. Corey Crocker with the mobility group with the university, longstanding efforts to try to humanize uh, the university district and keep it human and also have public places. And thinking of the Allegro, it's a little bit older than uh, John than the Displacement Coalition, but not that much older. I suspect that, that some of the early in, uh, conversations took place at the Allegro before the Displacement Coalition went formal, uh, as so many um, activities in Seattle that had their precursors uh, at the Allegro. <laughs> so anyway, thank you all. I see family, friends, neighbors, uh, students. Thank you for being here. It, it's uh, great to see you. This should be a lively um, and informative uh, session here. Um, we're going to dive right in. I've got about 10 to 12 minutes to cover a, sh a short slide deck. I just want to preface by saying this was a community-led effort, initially spearheaded by the Displacement Coalition, but taken up by the University District Small Business Asso Alliance. Is that what it's called, Rick? Something like that, with Rick as one of the champions here. Uh, and it was, uh, the work was done largely to address uh, the, the city's intent to rezone the university district as part of the overall uh, HALA housing affordability, livability agenda uh, effort that was still underway to upzone most much of the business districts throughout the city, including the five urban centers which the university district is part of. And that uh, was cause for great concern among many here, many small businesses and residents where there are still, there's still a level of affordability and a place to start a small business and to grow one. And so we're gonna get into that. Let's go to the first slide here. And I'll just tell you, so the purpose was to better inform the city and, the, and, the, and communities on issues affecting small businesses and nonprofits in the university district. And there was a great support from the non nonprofit, including Roots here, uh, with the effort that was undertaken. Uh, questions were developed through a community-led process. My role, as my consulting role, was to help facilitate, bring some professionalism to the process and some objectivity and some science-based approaches to the work. But it was really, I, I can't emphasize enough, this was a community process involving directly the local businesses and nonprofits with help from the city's Office of Economic Development. I want to just a shout out to Mike Wells, who's here on behalf of OED. He was very helpful personally and engaged in the efforts and offered some advice and review of our approaches and so forth. Um, the, it was conducted entirely anonymously, the survey work, with community volunteers over a period of about 10 days or so with, with some oversight. We'll move to the next slide. Oh, I've got this, I'm sorry, Cliff, I guess I can do that from here. Uh, is this, I just go backwards, forwards, is that it? Okay, so this was done in 2017, in August. Approximately 200 plus small businesses were identified. We used a, a database from the city that was, I'm sorry to say, was pretty outdated and of some help, but not, but we found there were a lot of businesses that just weren't even on the records. And we focus on small independently operated, owner operated businesses, not the franchises, not the larger businesses. Um, and so in all 123 businesses were directly contacted by door to door personal interviews. Uh, and I, some may have been taken by phone, but it was really a face to face effort, which is quite remarkable. And 90% along the University Ave uh, itself from 41st to 56. And on, we went around the side streets a little bit, but we didn't have the time or the resources to do the entire university district. As you know, Brooklyn and Roosevelt are key 
uh, business corridors as well, as well as the side street. So does this, does this work here? Did I just oh, don't worry. I got uh, you. Okay. So next one. So, so just to give you an idea of the demographics here, 85% of the businesses were run by the owner, in other words, owner-operated. That is one of the precepts of Pike Place Market and how it is always run. And so it's an important uh, uh, data point in that a very large number of owner-operated businesses with the biz owners on the premises working day to day. Uh, and we have a, a, a restaurant, uh, obviously, cafes, eateries, coffee houses were the largest category, followed by merchandise, about 29%. Retail clothes. This the district is known for its vintage clothing stores, and uh, it's um, uh, it's one of the reasons people come to the district who don't necessarily live here. Professional services, of course, fill out that array of of, uh, of things that make for a complete neighborhood. And then, of course, brew pubs, represented by no other than Rick McLaughlin and the Big Time and many others. So we'll move on. Mm -hmm. And then uh, and so. Uh, the profile, let's see, um, this just talks about the kind of physical characteristics of the small businesses. 50% less than 25 foot storefront. That's about half the width of this room. That, those are pretty small storefronts. Something that people like. It's the finer fabric that makes for a unique na a character of our business district. 59% were under 2,000 square feet. Also quite small in that regard. Okay. And then um, space needs, most of the businesses, 90% um, rent their commercial space. They're not owners, uh, property owners, let me make that clear. And 15% on a month-to-month -month basis. So uh, that's a fairly high proportionality of month-to-month -month renters there. Most felt that their spaces were sufficient. They liked the small, the uh, opportunity to have that, that kind of a configuration. And, uh, and it suits the, the business plans of most, it, according to our findings. Okay. Uh, how many years? Now, this is interesting also. Over 25 years, 24% or one, nearly a quarter have been there over 25 years. Um, that addresses some of the legacy businesses that you th might think of uh, under those definitions, which I think Council Member Herbold is going to talk to. Um, zero to five years, another quarter. So there's quite a spectrum there of new, newer businesses, older businesses, providing le stability and familiarity, as well as newness with the newer. So that, that, I think that's an impressive array in terms of tenureship. And then um, full and part-time. Now this is quite an uh, uh, important finding. 65% of the respondents, again, we covered a, pr a significant portion of the businesses, at least at the street level and some upper levels along the Ave, 65% responded, identified as women or minority owned, and in many cases, both. 70% of the businesses have minority and immigrant employees. Okay. And if located on the Ave, do you envision your business will likely remain there in 10 years? And 20% uh, unsure, don't know. 73% said yes. Uh, which is a positive, I think, indication of an intent to stay and a desire to stay. If the property where your business is located were to be upzoned, would it have a positive or negative effect on your business? And the negative, obvious, is the very highest, with almost 50% uh, fearing the upzone that had been proposed. 26% didn't know, and 22% suggested it was a po would be a positive thing to have the upzone. These are pretty basic questions, but kind of getting at some of the central issues. Commonly cited neighborhood issues, street homelessness, crime, theft, et cetera, street conditions, alleys, high operating costs, traffic, parking, those things tend to come up. Um, and some positive uh, comments regarding light, light rail and its advent of arrival here soon with the Brooklyn Station. Um, more police, accessibility, lack of political responsiveness came up. Uh, to small business challenges. Now, we didn't plant these terms. They were provided to us in the comments, and we summarize the comments. So, and need for affordable housing. There's a strong commitment socially here in the Ave, I think, represented by the business community as well as residents and others, okay? And then um, future of the Ave regarding rezoning, some of the similar issues, fear of displacement due to redevelopment, rising taxes, higher rents, 
Oppor on the opportunity side, potential for increased customers and foot traffic, again, light rail, um, hoping the area will be cleaned up with the up zone. That's not necessarily end and end. Okay, I've got, I'm at the 10 minute mark. And increased property value. So let's continue. Mm -hmm. And what would you need to remain in the university district? Um, protection from redevelopment was one of the listed and some of the same kinds of issues, lower taxes, et cetera. Let's move on. Mm -hmm. um, and then recommendations part of this. Now, we did some research around commercial gentrification in the United States. There's not a whole lot out there, I can tell you, that's current. Um, and so we kind of combined a perspective from what um, research has been done recently within the last few years. Gentrification is both economic, cultural, and social. It's not just one thing and it's complex, um, but it generally means displacement of one kind of population or community. So the recommendations, um, or, or the findings here, I should say, Large, a predominant business, businesses are women minority owned, business frontages are small, tenants feel vulnerable, many perceive the up zone negatively. And let's move on to the next one with the recommendations here. And this comes from Steinberg Urban Strategies and myself, uh, the need to provide better outreach to small businesses vulnerable to displacement before the up zone, not after, especially to English as second language businesses and, and, and immigrant communities. Uh, we did not find, and this is no criticism of Lisa's shop, which is a great one at City Hall, that the, the level of outreach that would be expected when imposing such a, a dramatic change of conditions economically in, amongst vulnerable business communities and residential communities. So we felt the city could do much better, particularly in light of its longstanding social, race and social justice uh, initiative or, or litmus test that things are supposed to go through. And I should add immigrants to that list also. Update the city's database so that there's a better knowledge about and map those businesses before proposing dramatic up zones. Uh, and identify where they're located, who, what type, what are the characteristics, just as we tried to do, and then employ some best practice anti-displacement measures. I think Council Member Herbal may talk about that for small businesses. And there are a number of of, of, of strategies, incentives, and other ways to address uh, and to uh, protect those small businesses. Usually it means involving them in the first place up front in the beginning before changes are proposed. And propose a community informed up zoning and development standards that will help protect those small businesses and the character that people uh, value and cherish. Uh, strengthen the, the zoning development standards, and that deals with design reviews, store frontages, the width of frontages. If you, if you have a development that's a full block and you just let anything go, you get big box development and it can wipe out half a dozen businesses that used to be there on the, st on the street frontage. Two minutes. Okay, yeah, we're, we're just about here. Um, and then also recognition of the importance of landmark preservation. It can go hand in hand with housing preservation and protection for small businesses if the, these, these tools and incentives are coupled. And finally, uh, strengthen the social services that goes without saying and our city's response to street homelessness and youth. Next one. Um, this is a really important slide here. And I just want to take a, a few seconds to talk about that colorful patchwork quilt there actually represents the parcels that the city, through its studies, had identified as potential high, develop, high low, medium redevelopment parcels, not just blocks. But it is possible to go through with this kind of information and identify the number of businesses, where they're located, and which are most subject to displacement through increased rents, uh, loss of tenancy, and all of the other pressures that go, go with that hand in hand. So I'd say this is something really helpful that the city provided, but it didn't, wasn't taken to the next step. Finally, we'll just uh, put a plug in for the work of the Displacement Coalition. This was a precursor to our study done by the Displacement Co a Coalition that looked at housing affordability and the impacts of upzoning, found that some 1,200 units in the university district would be highly uh, vulnerable to displacement through redevelopment and the destruction of the many red brick buildings that exist here that have no protections right now that provide that level of market rate low income housing. Thank you very much for your time and attention. And I'll join the panel. Okay, thank you very much.
No, it was, it was good. It was good. You get an A. There you go. So, uh, that being said, um, I just want to retroactively announce that... Uh, hold on. We are looking at... 5 to uh, 15 minute times for each of our guests. That being said, um, do you, Gail, do you prefer uh, Chair McIntyre? You, do you want to speak? No. You, you sure? No, I'm really not. Sure? I believe in you. No, I don't. Okay, fair enough. That's okay, it's okay. See, sometimes I don't make folks answer questions for my students in the audience. See, sometimes. That being said, um, so let's move on to our next speaker, Rick McLaugh ah, McLaughlin. My apologies. And uh, yeah, uh, so just go over the schedule. You have five minutes. Uh, Mr. Peterson, you have five minutes. And then Councilmember Herbold, you have 10 to 15 um, field questions or things like that. All right? Yes, okay. sir. Is this live working? Uh, yeah. Hi everybody, my name is Rick and uh, I was essentially a concerned small business owner uh, on the AV when the city started going through um, and started essentially pushing this up zone through. They hadn't even consulted or talked or notified any of us and all of a sudden there's this whole city plan saying, oh you know what, you know, we need to start putting 32 story buildings in the U district and uh, you know, we need you guys on board and we're like, hey wait a second, you know, like we got to assess this. Uh, that's where's the data, you know, even justifying the need for these types of up zones. And they're like, well, we have a housing crisis in the city, so we have to do it to justify, you know, the affordable housing uh, crisis that we're, you know, having. It's like, well, okay, that's that's one topic. That's a separate topic. Um, where's your studies on gentrification, uh, cultural impact, small business impact? And uh, they had none. And they essentially had an EIS at the time that was, you know, pretty pretty crappy um, and we said you know what you know uh, let's let's do some of the city's work for them and let's create our own small business impact study and let's try to you know use data to show the vulnerabilities that are here and uh, try to use as much um, uh, impact through uh, you know collecting small businesses and uniting them together uh, that way it's a stronger voice and so that's essentially what we did, um, and ultimately, you know, we, you know, tried to get advice from people here and there, and Peter Steinbrook was definitely somebody that I leaned on for advice, and Lisa Herbold is another one, and we tried to create a strategy uh, to try to save, um, you know, the U District as a whole, um, but we failed, and we were able to pull the AV out and uh, focus on small business uh, districts. Because really the AV is a unique thing. It's kind of like the last small business incubator in the city. Um, it's the last place to try to find an affordable rent uh, as a commercial renter. Um, and it's the last place where you can find a lot of small um, mom and pops that actually own properties. And that's when commercial business districts thrive and do their best is when you have essentially um, a small business owner that's the property owner that you know owns maybe one or two lots and they have a direct relationship with their business tenants who are inside there and uh, you know when, when that happens you know both thrive because then you have more of like a, a family you know kind of unity in the U district and that's been going away for a while now um, you know UW is a large uh, buyer of properties as well as the University District Parking Association um, they're a very, very large uh, group of property owners that are kind of, you know, having their will made in the U District. So ultimately, what uh, we try to say is, hey, you know, like community culture and small businesses matter. Like, you know, let's let's do some research and let's try to uh, fight it the best we can. And so that's what we've been doing and continue to do. Um, I think that the city is going to keep trying to upzone um, small business, you know, areas forever you know in this city um, I don't think it's going to go away anytime soon um, but I think if we Two can minutes. get as much uh, you know voices that are informed that care about those businesses that they go to that care about the nonprofit services that are in that area um, then ultimately what we'll have is a stronger community voice and not just a small business voice and that's really you know what we're trying to do here today is um, you know be here to answer questions uh, talk about what we're doing um, and uh, another shout out uh, to Mason over at uh, University Heights. Um, he's the assistant director there. Um, we started working with him to create um, essentially free legal counsel and free legal advice for small business and nonprofit owners. And so we just met with the King County Bar Association a couple weeks ago. 
And um, it's really exciting to have some projects like that underway. And, uh, you know, just uniting more, um, you know, nonprofits in the area to work with uh, small businesses and residents. Um, and when that happens, you know, you, communities are everything. And uh, that's what we're here fighting for. So thanks for your time. Thank you very much. Wow. You're a minute early. Nice one. Okay. All right, uh, my name's Chris Peterson. I own Cafe Allegro in the U District. We're a, <laughs> we're a community-based business. I mean, we talk to uh, people that live and work and operate businesses in the district all the time. Um, one of the things from a small business perspective that, that I'm concerned with in terms of the AV is that we've upzoned the the vast majority of the business district here already. There's going to be a tremendous amount of pressure on the AV should any more, any further upzoning happen um, to both gentrify and uh, change the essential character of what we've got. And I think we've got a lot that's worth preserving here. We have a lot of legacy businesses as Peter pointed out we have a lot of minority and women-owned businesses here. We have opportunities for, uh, you know, first-time business owners. We have some commercial affordability based on the structure of the AV and the, the fact that there's a lot of older storefronts. We have, um, we have uh, residential affordability above those commercial units um, in older buildings, which it will preserve some affordability in housing. I think um, all of us know that, um, you know, affordable housing isn't really being provided in new buildings. New buildings are expensive to live in. And so older buildings are important, both from a business and a residential standpoint. Um, and I think also the way that I look at the AV is I think it's, it is a, while maybe not a historic district, it's historically worth preserving. It's one of the most important business shopping districts in Seattle, has been for over 100 years. Um, I think if we look out at the areas in Seattle that we've preserved, like Pike Place Market or Ballard Avenue, we would say we've never made a mistake by preserving something. And I think we need to preserve what we have here. We, and I think Ballard Avenue is a great example. There's upzoning all around that street, but what people love about going to that neighborhood is going to the old street, all of the shops and restaurants that are on old Ballard Avenue, and I think we could have the same thing here. So that's what I have to say. Excellent, thank you. So before we begin, uh, just a couple of points of information. One, um, and if one of you wants to field this, is fine. But just going forward, not everyone may know what upzoning is. So if, awesome. Uh, second of all, uh, just not so much uh, big admonishment, but a little wag of the finger. The term minority is actually a little antiquated. Uh, people of color would be actually more accurate. So for example, for a point of information, District 2, we are actually the majority, people of color. So while in, whether it was in District 4, it would be a little bit different, so on and so forth. So not a big admonishment, but important to note. And the uh, last uh, thing just want to put out there is, um, oh, I forgot. Got the point I was going to say. So, um, without any further ado, council member, if you'd like to take it away. Thank you. Hello? Yeah. All oh, right, you got me? You got All right, fantastic. Um, thank you so much for coming out tonight. Uh, earlier this evening, uh, until about 6 30, I was at another convening of uh, business owners um, that the uh, Soto BIA convened of all of the BIAs throughout the city. And this was a meeting specifically focused on the public safety uh, challenges that many of our business districts are dealing with right now. Um, the BIAs, as you probably know, fund um, some of the activities uh, in partnership with the city, uh, clean city activities to deal with garbage. Um, in in the University District, the U District BIA funds some outreach services. Um, and so this was a, um, a very heated, shall I say, meeting with uh, lots of folks from um, 
from the council, lots of folks from um, SPD and the fire department, SPU, human services department, uh, really trying to figure out um, how to do, frankly, uh, a better job addressing the public safety needs um, of our business districts. I think um, I appreciate that um, we heard uh, a bit from Rick about the context for uh, Commissioner Steinbrook's study, and I think what's most important to take away about that story um, is that because of organizing and because of the strategizing um, that Rick and others did, um, the council made the decision based on you know a really persuasive argument that we shouldn't make a decision about um, something that we hadn't studied yet and that we needed to hit pause while we studied it. And they were successful in getting the city council to uh, take the proposed upzone for the AV that was also proposed and did pass for the, for the rest of the, um, the neighborhood, but to take it out of the proposal um, until um, we had more information about what the needs were of the business district. And that's what led to uh, Commissioner Steinbrook's uh, work that um, I think really uh, confirmed what a lot of people uh, just knew through their experience, um, both here in the university district and just watching the city change um, over time. Um, and so I think moving forward, a lot of those recommendations are going to be helpful to me as a policymaker, but I think it's um, really helpful to folks who are advocating for their communities to really focus on what those recommendations are and what we've learned from them and carrying that message through. Um, I also want to give a shout out to the Office of Economic Development and Michael Wells. They have a lot of programs fo specifically focused on um, small businesses and um, everything from, uh, you know, working with the BIAs, which is, I think, one of the things that they're most known uh, for. But they also um, work to uh, work on a program called Only in Seattle, which works with business districts to um, help them create an identity for themselves and uh, market themselves in a way that uh, Im Im improves the, the, the business climate. They also have a program called Restaurant for Success. Um, and, you know, I myself personally, I represent uh, West Seattle and South Park. I have, um, you know, just ran across a wonderful example of the work that they do in uh, facilitating what are sometimes some difficult uh, discussions and um, uh, decision making with the Department of Construction and Inspection. Um, I uh, attended a, um, the opening of a small business in South Park the other day and um, she told me how staff at OED were indispensable in helping her get a permit that um, she had really at a last, last minute um, was being told that she wasn't going to be able to get. So the work that they do is, is really important. It um, is very focused on small businesses. As it relates specifically to uh, the Mandatory Housing Affordability Program, which is sort of the context uh, under which a lot of these upzones are happening, um, that's a program that is designed to extract from developers resources for affordable housing. In some cases, that, that would be a fee that then the city would issue an RFP for nonprofits to compete to build the housing with those dollars. Um, in some cases, that will mean performance, that including uh, affordable housing in the developments that they're building. It's a small number of units um, of affordable housing. In most cases, it's under, under 10%. Um, I have um, been an advocate of increasing um, the, uh, the, the requirement of developers to contribute. And the reason why this program that's about affordable housing is coupled with zoning is because we can't, it's not legal for us to make them, make developers pay into an affordable housing fund or uh, include affordable housing in their buildings unless we give them something of value. And something of value is, um, uh, that the city has is additional zoning capacity. So in most areas, um, that's, you know, a floor or two. But that's definitely not the case in uh, many of our business areas, business districts. Um, because of my concern about uh, displacement, um, 
prior to the executive issu issuing their recommendations about um, MHA and how much how much zoning capacity uh, to to uh, to give through these up zones, the city did what's called a displacement risk analysis and they um, they did an analysis of the likely redevelopment all over the city and identified areas that were of high risk of displacement and um, again I don't think um, we've gone far enough with that information that's been really useful uh, in as part of this decision making around citywide MHA one of the good things that has happened out of requiring the city to do a displacement risk analysis is that the zoning increases that they're proposing in the areas of um, of high displacement risk are the minimum amount of, of zoning increases that they could um, that they could grant um, and still extract a, a housing payment so I think that's that's a pretty significant um, uh, acknowledgement from the city that um, up zones do have an impact on on gentrification um, and on the ability of small businesses to stay um, within a district that has that is experiencing these up zones um, one of the things that I worked on doing during the um, the effort here in the university district was to require working with uh, John Fox um, on the residential side. Um, he um, he had his uh, displacement risk analysis on the number of housing units he felt um, through the the methodology that he used that we, we would lose with these with these up zones and um, we've seen development uh, consistent with with John's. Uh, predictions in, in some cases. Um, the city had a different number. Uh, it was quite a bit lower, uh, significantly lower. Um, the argument I tried to make is let's have a small increment of an increased percent uh, to, um, to uh, basically require developers to pay a little bit more because of the displacement impact that they were going to have. And so we kind of, we kind of, you know, rather than arguing with S, um, OPCD, Office of Planning and Community Development, about whose number was right, we used their, we used their, um, their own number, which I think was, it was 200 units, is that right, John? It was fi 50 to 200. Right. So what we did is we figured out um, what would it cost to replace those units and what would that translate to in an increase in the develop development requirement. Um, so I proposed an amendment to do that. It was a really small <laughs> increment of additional requirement for developers and I un unfortunately was not successful in getting that amendment passed. So um, there's sort of this, uh, I think, in a, in a way, a little bit of uh, a schizophrenic nature that the city has with planning in that we, we acknowledge that um, up zones um, can result in displacement, but we're not really willing to do a whole lot to mitigate that displacement. So, um, you know, I'm going to keep pushing on this as it relates to MHA. Uh, one of the things that... Uh, Commissioner Steinbrook's recommendations were related specifically to um, historic a, a need for historic an inventory of historic properties as part of the uh, mandatory housing affordability up zones. Ten um, minutes. How many? Oh, you're at ten minutes. Okay, so you have thanks. More. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that we saw recently was that um, the city was up in arms about the fact that uh, the show box was um, likely to be torn down for a development. But that was a development that was um, being uh, proposed by a, uh, a developer who was going to buy the property under the city's own new zoning regulations that we had just passed a couple years ago. But that's because we are, um, I think, approaching zoning from um, kind of using a chainsaw instead of more of a scalpel. And so, um, you know, and I, I believe that if we had really thought about what, what are the structures in, in this area that we're, we're rezoning that we want to preserve, we, we will hopefully approach those decisions differently. So as it relates to my district, District 1 in West Seattle and South Park, I've begun um, a, a working with the Southwest Historical Society, um, a somewhat of an inventory of our um, our historic and landmark properties and not just the ones that are currently um, landmarked but the ones that we um, think might be eligible for landmarking in the future and so 
um, based on that information, I might make some proposed amendments to the MHA legislation as it relates specifically to West Seattle and South Park to, to actually use zoning to preserve those properties that we as a city have identified as important. Lastly, um, uh, again, a shout out to OED for working with me um, over the last several years. One of the first issues that I started working on as a city council member was this concept of a legacy business. Um, I was approached by um, a constituent who um, happened to write a book um, about dive bars in Seattle. Um, he's an author. He used to be um, a reporter for the Seattle Weekly. And um, he uh, talked to me about the fact that other cities have legacy business programs. He pointed to San Francisco um, and their legacy business prog program and th how they had they had preserved over 200 businesses with that program. He pointed to uh, London, where they have a, uh, an English pub legacy business program, and to Paris, which has a, a legacy business pro program focused on, uh, on bookstores. And the idea being a legacy business program could be focused on older businesses that the community cares about that also say something about a city or a neighborhood's identity. So um, we've been sort of plugging, around, uh, plugging along slowly on this uh, for the last two and a half years. And um, I think we're, we're taking the, the step that I've hoped that we um, were going to take for a long time. Um, through the budget process, we are um, going to take, again, that, that next step in actually developing a program. And um, Office of Economic Development is going to be developing specific tools focused on, on how to help older businesses stay in place in those instances that they, that they want to continue as a business. You know, it's so, for me, it's so important to, to focus not just on um, on small business, but specifically legacy business, because in a city that's changing so much, m many times our businesses are our bridge to to our city's culture, to our history, um, and to really what we are about a city. So um, we'll be looking at a process by which we can designate at least one legacy business in each district throughout the city. And again, like I said, um, Office of Economic Development is de developing specific tools for legacy businesses to help um, those that are designated. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. And I should add that you've uh, saved us two minutes. You're two minutes early. Right on, right on. So uh, this time we're going to open it up for questions from the crowd. I know that. And also, can we give another round of applause to our panelists? So, just for a random shout out, don't worry, I see you, John. <laughs> just for a random shout out uh, to Seattle uh, Displacement Coalition that's organizing this as their as a uh, as a part of their Who Rules Seattle um, ser uh, series of discussions, and also, of course, KODX LP ninety six point nine Seattle, one of the best independent uh, radio stations in the city. Here's looking at you guys. So, in that case, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, actually, um, we talked about that, Gail. Did you change your mind? Did you want to? Sure. Yeah. If I can hold it, it's okay. Do I have to hold something while I do it? No, Gargoyles, my shop, has been on the app for 25 years, and we're there because of our community and community coming together. Oh, it. Here, let me. That's no, okay. You can them. But um, anyway, I I just want to really. Uh, oh, this is good. Oh, isn't this, it? it's on. Okay. You can't hear me at all. Okay. Okay. Well, I just want to emphasize how important community is and keeping our small businesses here. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's all I really well, want to say. If you want to ask me questions, we've been here a really so, long time. So, uh, so just to clarify. Um, by the way, thank you for that. Sorry, put you on the spot. Just to clarify, we had actually talked about Gail speaking. So if we have a new panelist, then um, let's keep it to two minutes, Mark, in order to open it up to the floor. Uh, was person from Greenwood? Oh, oh, there you are. Well, well, don't be shy, Peter. Come, come on. Is this working? Yes, it is. You nope, just have to actually, kiss it. Hold on. Uh, Pete, Peter, I got, I got it. No, uh, Peter, I mean, I'm going to let him use mine. <laughs> 
I appreciate the enthusiasm, but don't worry, we got this. Uh, it wasn't really so much an announcement. I was just kind of more here to ask questions. Uh, the Greenwood Community Council is preparing to do a, sur a survey of the, our own, uh, specifically geared towards the legacy uh, report. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're going to at least try to uh, uh, survey all of the businesses in Greenwood, the classical uh, borders of Greenwood, Aurora to 8th and uh, 105th to 75th. Um, yeah, I mean, more, I, I just had questions. That's all I really have to announce that we're planning on doing that and trying to establish that. The only kind of issue I had is that I'm a little bit concerned about the criteria of what defines a legacy business because it, uh, it seems like it's mostly going to be bars and restaurants because it's where large groups of people congregate at the same time, whereas your hairdresser, you know, you might all, there might be a whole group of people that individually meet their hairdresser. They don't know each other, but they might know each other through the hairdresser, for, you know, just for instance. Uh, so that's just something we were hoping to make suggestions to expand the definition. Yeah, the, the definition has not been created yet. There, there is a definition that was used for purposes of the study, okay. but as far as what the guidelines are going to be um, in designating a business as a legacy business, that is unwritten so far. Okay. And that's sort of the next step that we're going to be working on with, with the Office of Economic Development. Some cities have um, kind of used a cookie cutter approach and kept it Pretty, pretty broad, maybe it's a category, a number of year, a category of business in a number of years. Other cities have really let the individual districts um, decide for themselves mm -hmm. what the criteria should be. So you think about like what's important in, in Greenwood. And so you use that, um, that sort of visioning exercise to determine what your guidelines are and what businesses would be eligible for applying for legacy business status. Um, I think your, your, um, your hairdresser, uh, I, I think in the, the case that I'm thinking of, a Barbershop, Earl's, um, is a great, great example um, in the Central District. That is, uh, that would be um, a great legacy business because um, of the role that that shop has had in that area for, for generations in an area in particular that is changing and seeing its residential community um, be displaced out of the neighborhood, it again is so important to maintain those, um, those cultural um, entities uh, that are institutions that in often those cultural entities are businesses. So, in that case, before we open it up, I want to ask a follow-up question to you, Council Member. Um, so, what will be the criteria for the stakeholders to come to, that you will bring to a table to, um, to draw out the list of these legacy businesses? So, um, I think Office of Economic Development has uh, uh, sort of stakeholders in different business districts. There are, um, there are staff people. Um, that are assigned to each of our legislative districts, uh, council districts for the city. So they are, they are always working with the business stakeholders in each of the city's seven districts. But I don't think that we need to, you know, limit it to an already known list. Um, and, you know, I, I think the, the idea that I've been envisioning for um, the, the nomination process, um, again, might be you create some broad citywide sort of a skeletal set of guidelines, but then um, after, again, after working with the business districts in, in each of the seven districts, you al we also kind of layer upon it some district-specific um, guidelines. But, um, but again, this is a work in progress. I've, I've been um, working on it for the last two and a half years, and it's, it's probably going to take another, another at least six months to get it up off the ground. All right, folks. So let's uh, start fielding some questions. I'm just going to facilitate going around this way. Okay, so please raise your hands high. I'm a little bit of an old fogey, so I might not be able to see you. Um, yes, ma'am. Taverns <laughs> that were 
Modern America in Tappan, New York, and it's a uh, site of um, where uh, George Washington and his whole crew used to be. And the <laughs> fact is that, um, and this is something that could be uh, sort of translated into any of our legacy businesses, is that um, th this, these taverns are where the American Revolution was hatched. We would not have had the American Revolution without these taverns where people were able to meet because there was no place else to meet. And except for a church where you weren't going to have to write revolution. <laughs> so so um, it, it, it just is an indication of the, the meaning that it has to our communities for you know, bringing people together and kind of creating opportunities for conversations so, and to you know, move the culture forward. So I just want to thank you for doing this because it's super, super important. And, uh, and, and the idea of preserving the buildings themselves, the original buildings, uh, some of them may change or be remodeled or be added on to, um, but it, it just is so important to preserve those. Um, just like you talked about uh, in, the, in the Ballard neighborhood, having that original uh, feeling just, it, it has so much meaning. And, you know, tearing everything down and just, you know, putting in a few nail shops that are just all brought in from, you know, God knows where. Uh, it's just, uh, it's, not a, it's not a substitute for what, uh, what has been developed by, by families. And that's the other thing, element is that there's, these are family businesses. And preserving that is uh, also very important. And if I could touch base on that. The best way to help preserve small businesses is to shop at small businesses. And it's very convenient to just purchase things on Amazon, on your phone and whatnot. But the best thing to do is use your buying power and uh, you know, your own footprint that you make on the city. Because uh, that's, that's what really small businesses need more than anything else. Um, and the Legacy Business Program is a great uh, program. And Lisa Herbold is a saint amongst uh, not too many saints on the council. And so that's another thing that we should, you know, think about as community is, you know, voting and, you know, really, t you know, t take a close look at who you want to have, you know, stand in place because we've seen what happens when uh, politicians that are, you know, a little bit more development greedy uh, get in power and our city changes right from underneath us in a very, very short period of time with really no input from us. So we need to make sure that we uh, vote and that we uh, use our buying power um, Anyways, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. So, uh, sir, I'll just go around. Yeah. Hi. Um, we're a part of the new district in Nevada. I have actually a question about capital structures for the small business group that's sitting here. I feel like, without getting into specifics about it, like, is there an appetite among the small business owners and participants who Commissioner Steinbrook interviewed to form and create a formalized co op like capital structure? Because there are categorically investors, probably in overlapping pools that are giving money to developers that today would be interested in knowing that there are cash generating businesses, some of them 25 years old and longer, who wish to acquire property in the U district. I mean, to me it feels like, I, I, I don't know, I don't sit in your meetings, to what extent is the association, especially people who've been in business for a decade, 20 years, you're bringing in cash every day. Like, for, for finance, that's, that's not a tech startup. That's real dough every day, and you can, you can. I mean, I don't have to explain this to you. Bank of America isn't giving Allegro a loan, but if it's Allegro plus 15, we're coming with a formalized fund with real progressive rules. Of con I mean, this these numbers that Commissioner Steinberg set up: 70% of your businesses are people of color and women. I mean. I mean, that's, that's uncommon, and that's also, frankly, a ton of economic opportunity. And I'm just wondering to what extent, if, is there that, like, is there an interest within the organization to think about that? Um, yes, that would be great, but at the end of the day, what you find is the, uh, in, say we get a group of investors that wanted to help purchase a building. Well, then, you know, we'll, we'll try to come to terms and then, you know, say the price is $8 million. And then a different organization will come in and be like, oh, well, we'll double that. You know, like, you know, don't, don't sell it to them. Sell it to us for, you know, double the price. 
And that's what we've seen time and time again. Um, I mean, I have friends that own their buildings and they wanted to sell to local people, but the money that's just being thrown around right now in the city of Seattle is just so ridiculous. That's like, how do you turn down an extra sometimes $10 million um, over what it's worth? Uh, and so it's that it's great in theory, but in application right now, uh, we we'd have to we need to have better policies in place first. We need to have uh, better politicians in place first, um, and we need to you know have community engagement um, and and a stronger voice, and then we can hopefully start thinking about programs like that um, to make a stance and try to unite. But yeah, I mean it's it's a great idea. Okay. Um, yes, over there, Miss. Yes, you, yeah. I'm studying affordable housing. Can't really see you, sorry. Um, I love affordable housing. It's like my favorite thing in the world, but I feel like it's used as a justification many times to benefit certain income classes while hurting others. And we've seen that with things like subsidizing Safeco Field, a private RFP for the Mercer Mega Block, the repeal of the head tax, the failure to utilize Tolaris for affordable housing. Um, and then we see these policy choices that end up upzoning places like the Ave and putting small businesses out of business for the sake of affordable housing. Um, and I'm wondering if there is a space in these policy discussions to actually redistribute that burden. And will we ever see maybe some single family zones upzoned where there are some white homeowners instead of people of color who are renters? Um, and if that will ever be a part of these policy discussions and whether or not um, we can see that balance instead of just continuing to subsidize developers and big business. Even the multifamily tax exemption, for example, gives big tax breaks to developers while only making them build affordable for about 70 or 80% of AMI, which as we all know is actually quite a lot of money in Seattle. So is there a space in our political atmosphere right now to do some really bold policy choices that redistribute that burden onto people who have the means? So, so that, that was a lot to try to answer. Um, and so I'm going to start on some of the background behind it, because some people might not know. Uh, essentially, this all started because Seattle had a housing crisis. And so they're like, oh, we want to upzone the city. Well, they could have gone about it in actually in a smart way and took certain pockets that needed zoning changes and you know left other ones alone. But essentially, there was so much money to be made in Seattle that all the developers wanted a piece of it. So uh, back in the day, Ed Murray and uh, a council member uh, got in a room with a whole bunch of uh, developers, and they wrote what's called the Grand Bargain. And essentially, it is the Grand Bargain for developers, but it's not for the city and the dwellers. And um, essentially, they even did some studies, and they found this, they're using what's called an FAR calculator to try to uh, use square footage of zoning changes to uh, try to give uh, developer impacts and what those should be. And not to throw around a lot of terms, but essentially um, what they found was in their own studies that the, the fees, so if they don't put in affordable housing units, which in my opinion should be around like 20, 25% in these buildings with these vast zoning changes. And in reality, it's coming in around like 7%, um, which is laughable and sad because that's basically saying, oh, down the road, 7% of the working class can afford to be in the city because that's what this is. This isn't in the impoverished of the city even. This is us. This is small business owners, residents, workers. That's, oh, down the road, 7% of us are going to be here. And that's just laughable. And that fact that that's their plan is just disgusting. So then they so they found it's like okay, well, what should the penalty be per square foot? I think it came in around uh, like sixty to sixty-five dollars a square foot or something like that. And the developers didn't like that. They're like, oh no, that's not good, you know, because none of them are going to actually put in the affordable units in their buildings. They're just going to pay whatever the impact fee is. So they're like, okay, like how about you know, ten to twenty dollars, you know, a square foot? Like that sounds great. And sometimes it's even less than that. Um, and it's laughable what we're giving up um, right now as far as square footage to what we're actually getting back. And that's why they're trying to zone and upzone the entire city is because without that large impact of, you know, affecting everybody and zoning everybody out, um, there wouldn't be enough money to even start to justify what they're causing to have happen in the city. And that's why they're doing it to such a large scale. Um, but uh, essentially, HALA, you know, it's, it's, it's great in theory. Um, they just failed in practice. 
And what they need to actually do is go back in and reassess the FAR calculator and reassess um, what, you know, the fees should be for developers, um, how much of the city should be affordable down the road for us, and, um, you know, what actually matters to the voters. And that's why we have to get out and vote because, you know, I hate to use the name, but Rob Johnson is public enemy number one in my point of view. And um, we, have to, we have to get him unelected. You know, there's just no way around it. Um, but now, uh, to touch on the, your, your later point about the new policies and other um, ideas and options, I'm going to hand it over to Lisa Herbold. So as far as whether or not there's a space, I think um, you're not going to be surprised to hear me say that we have to make the space, right? Um, I think uh, the point that Rick is making about the grand bargain and how it was uh, pu public policy uh, recommendations that were um, crafted out of the public eye um, really, I think, gets to the nub of the problem um, in, in public policy that's supposed to serve everybody. If, if, if you want to develop um, laws and programs that serve everybody, you have to have everybody in the room helping to draft and uh, formulate and implement <laughs> those programs. If, if, you, if you just have the folks, you know, who have the city's best interests at heart, <laughs> and um, which I believe most people working in city government do have the city's best interests at heart, but if you just have them in a room with um, people who have a monetary, uh, uh, re will receive a monetary benefit from the decisions that are made and you don't actually have uh, impacted people, uh, people with lived experiences, um, then the, the city folks, the folks who have people's best interests at heart, are not going to be able to take a tough enough stance with the, because the, it, it's basically a negotiation. Public policy is, is a negotiation. But if you want to negotiate from a position of power, you need more people in the room, not fewer people in the room. So uh, from my perspective, we really have to, um, we have to create the space. We have to question the spaces that already exist and question whether or not they are inclusive enough. Um, and just to answer your question specifically about um, um, single family housing. Um, so there was a, um, there has been a proposal to expand the city's accessory dwelling unit program. Um, that is one way of um, allowing um, structures other than single family structures in single family uh, neighborhoods. Um, and, and, and we see that some people um, already have um, developed ADUs under the current laws and those um, structures can be a, a great um, source of income for people who want to age in place uh, or people like myself who, um, you know, eventually want um, to have their mother live with them, um, the classic mother-in-law apartment, right, so, so that we can care for our elders. Um, so, that, you know, and, and the reason why we haven't been able to expand that is because um, the city has been um, uh, dealing with uh, an appeal. So it's been tied up in the courts. But um, we're, we're expecting uh, to be moving forward on that um, in early next year. Um, and then also the controversial mandatory housing affordability program that we've all been discussing also includes um, uh, a new zoning category for single family um, uh, zones that allows, uh, they're calling it residential sp small lot. So it would l allow up to, um, a, a building up to the, si the size of like a triplex. But again, it's, um, it's very controversial and some of the folks in this, in this room here today are involved um, in challenging that because of their own concerns about displacement impacts. Awesome. So I'm going to play the villain. I know a lot of people have their hands up and keep them up. It's a good thing. Uh, but so for if you have a comment, right, um, please uh, specify if you have a comment, if you have a question, please answer the question quickly. But if you have a comment, you're from the audience. I'm going to keep that to a minute or less, just so you know, not trying to shut anyone up. But we need to, you know, keep things moving for everyone. And also, I would only ask, I would ask our steam panelists, if you have a response, keep it to about two, maybe three minutes if it's super complex. Um, everything copacetic? We're all good with that? Beautiful. I love that.
just to make it really simple, we act, we're acting um, more like judges than legislators in making these decisions. And so we can, only, um, we can only read information that is on the record in a very special way. We can't even read newspaper articles about that topic. Right. OK, cool. So don't worry. Come back to you later. But yes, ma'am. Yes, you. Yeah, go ahead. One of the two of you, um, yes, ma'am, do you like to? Yes. Either one? <laughs> well, first, first of all, my name is Judy Bendage. I'm one of the attorneys who's been working on this appeal. I want to thank you very much, uh, Council Member Herbo, because the ideas that you have are perfect ideas to go to your community, look around, see what they want, see what their resources are, see what their businesses are, see what their historic resources are. That has not happened for 27 communities in this city. And that's why there's been an appeal. And so how do we unwind it? And because you're talking about elections, elections will come after the upzoning proposals are in front of the council. So, Unless something is done to say this has been done the wrong way, just as this panel has discussed, just as Commissioner Steinbrook has discussed, why didn't you listen to us from the beginning? Why didn't you come to us from the beginning? And this is true for Wallingford, Roosevelt, the junction in West Seattle, South Park. Ma'am, ma'am. So, so that's question? the question. How do you unwind it? So I unwind it as um, you and I, you know, I'm a believer of democracy and of the power of grassroots um, organizing and I know there's a lot of skepticism in the room, um, but I, I believe you can convince your council members um, that, that there are things. Hold on, let's just listen. It, not, not, not you by yourself, but um, I, think, I think the example that we, we started with. Um, is a is is proof. We took um, the city council took the AV out of the uh, land use code changes that were proposed up zone um, all of the university district, and they they were only able to do it not just because they convinced me, but because um, I think we worked together to convince the chair of the committee, who is also the council member representing this district. Um, that happened. Like, let's, let's remember, that actually did happen. <laughs> um, and it can, be, it can be replicated. The, um, the, the council has only had the MHA proposal um, since, when was it? I think it was December of last year when we first got it. All of the work that has been done prior, um, whether you, feel it was thorough or not, um, has had been done by the executive over, you know, depending on which meetings you're, you're counting since the, the grand bargain, um, you know, over the past two to, two to three years before it came to the council. And so each council member is, I think, going to be responsible for making district-specific changes to the MHA proposal to represent their communities. And I'm going to, you know, I'm going to fight like hell to get the votes to, to do so for District 1. Cool. So just moving on to this side. Um, yes, sir. Don't worry, see you. Of course, of course. Many entrepreneurs run businesses, and sometimes they age up. For example, in the 90s, we all knew Peter Hart of La Hacienda, um, the dance studio, that woman has passed away. The Greek restaurant the Continental was run by a family, and they, so they moved on. This happens throughout the city. It's a natural um, economic uh, factor. Um, I wonder, for Councilman Herbal, what you think the marginal increase in land value would be since the university is growing and link will open, the land will be more valuable anyway. So what's the marginal increase in square foot value with the upside? So there's going to be economic pressure anyway. So what's that margin? Margin is, um, yeah. you know, but but you're right. There is um, it, even without any um, any up zones, there are, are going to be there is pressure 
uh, to redevelop. And you know, all the changes that we've seen in the city um, over the last 20 years, um, many of them have happened under our current zoning. So, um, you know, I don't think um, I don't think we can say it's all MHA's fault because this is this is a cycle that has been occurring, and and it's a fact that when when we make investments in communities. Um, you know, good investments, investments in transit. Um, you know, when when we we fund rain gardens in uh, Del Ridge, you know, those are investments in low-income communities that are that that's good for the city. It's good for the people who live in those. But those those investments um, all contribute to to displacement, to gentrification. And so I, I you know I think it's um, a matter of um, Again, just being trying to be more intentional about the tools that we do have, uh, recognizing that we don't have all the tools. And I don't think anybody's talking about wanting to save businesses that don't want to be saved, right? That don't want to be preserved. A legacy business program, you can't, you can't nominate um, a legacy business who doesn't want to be nominated. It's different from the landmarking process like that, where you can landmark a building that, whose owner does not want to be landmarked. So um, it's, it's intended to be a tool for uh, strong businesses that are doing well that want to stay in a city. Great. Okay. And ma'am, in the green? So right now, it's actually kind of surprising. Um, we've been seeing actually more performance than uh, paying into the fund. Um, the, the program that we have now that most looks like the MHA program is a voluntary program. It's called Incentive Zoning. Um, under that program, the majority of funds have been raised um, that, that there, it's a, it, the participation has been mostly fee-based. And um, you know that contributes about twenty million dollars uh, a year um, over the last few years to the uh, the RFP that the Office of Housing issues every year. So uh, you know, for instance, last year we um, we issued an RFP uh, for a hundred million dollars so that nonprofits could bid, and the successful bidders um, were able to build a, are, are are in the process of building a hundred million dollars worth of housing. Um, about twenty million of that was was from the incentive zoning program. The, our experience so far with the mandatory housing affordability program uh, has been um, that there's actually been, and there hasn't been a whole lot of development under it yet, so you, it, you have to be careful not to jump to conclusions, but we have actually been seeing more performance um, than, uh, than uh, paying into the fund. Um, the, the goal that the city is setting um, it, in its MHA framework, it was 50% performance and 50% uh, payment of the fee because although, as Sarah Jane will often uh, remind me when I bring up this factoid, um, every $1 of um, an MHA payment will leverage another 2 to $3 in additional um, resources, but um, those are those are taxpayer dollars uh, for, but taxpayer dollars are specifically for affordable housing. So um, the fact that you can potentially build three times as much housing uh, when you have that that when you have that leverage, then then you can under the performance um, uh, approach. I think it I think it makes sense to to see to to see how it goes for a couple years before jumping to conclusions about you know what what is better performance or, or payment as it relates to the first part of your question um, you know I, I think you know know the answer to that question I mean MHA is really controversial if, if you let one neighborhood um, not uh, not uh, participate in it then no neighborhood's going to want to participate in it and then we'll never meet our our goal of 6,000 units of course that's that's a 
questionable um, whether it's questionable whether or not that's a high enough goal. And uh, you know, like I said, I've I've pushed for that fee and that performance to be, to be higher. Um, but I would also like to say, as far as South Park goes, there are there are a few people who are opposed to the um, the upzone in South Park, but. A lot, a lot of people are actually supportive of it because, again, we we are we're already seeing the impacts of of gentrification even in in South Park. Properties are being are being purchased and redeveloped, and from the perspective of many people in in that part of town, um, they would rather at, at least be able to get some affordable housing than than none. So, it's uh, you know it's it's one of those things that. Um, you know, I, I, I really think the answer is just really trying to be as neighborhood specific as, as you can in the decisions that you're making. And so I'm getting really granular with South Park. You, do, you, want, the, you, you want this area, you know, up zone, no, well then let's do it over here instead. And I think that's, that's what we really have to do is really get down into the details and get to, uh, street by street. Don't worry, I got you. All right, so uh, Commissioner Sandbrook, you want to make a comment? About 10 seconds. To Sarah Jane's uh, question about opting out uh, for South Park, in fact, in the early 90s, several uh, communities uh, such as Laurelhurst, Madison Park, and Magnolia Village opted out of the urban village strategy and are not designated. And they are still not. And they're still not scheduled for higher d density in those areas, except for a tiny fraction of the, the HALA proposal, proposed up zone. And, commercial neighborhood districts outside of urban villages. Oh, wait, hey, 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 do not break the queue. Hey, do not break the queue, lad. Do not break the queue. This is when I become mean. So let's not go there. Even in Western New York, we learn how to shout even better than the rest of the country. And I have the microphone. So don't worry, you'll get your turn, but you're at the back of the queue now. Uh, 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 you're, okay, mate, you're at the back of the queue now. Trust me, we can have this shouting match if you want. I'd rather not. Anyway, so don't break the queue. Um, so, and all my students know that. Well, see, I don't scream at y'all. Scream at other people. No, I'm also do. But anyway, I'm, I joke, I joke. Um, so uh, let's see. One, I did have one question from the crowd, though I got a little bit earlier. I've been holding back on. Uh, this question is for Council Member Herbold. Um, so if crowd member who ans uh, asked this, correct me if I'm wrong. But um, for, so a specific timeline to revisit um, to revisit um, the um, the up zone itself um, after and you I know you mentioned the elections and I know one of the um, uh, one of the members of the audience mentioned this but is there a specific timeline on revisiting uh, these up zoning plans and if so can you just break that down for us if you're oh, yeah. on the on the app yeah on the F. To my knowledge, there is no plan in the near future as it for for um, the the upzone on the Ave. I think um, you know. I I think the um, the council member who chairs that committee, uh, Council Member Johnson, was very um, transparent in his stated intention to come back to it. Um, but I, I, again, I haven't, I haven't seen the, the work plan for, for next year. And I know, um, I think, I know, I think, um, <laughs> it, it's one of those things that, um, you could say I know, or I think, because, um, we are, um, really focused on resolving the, uh, MHA appeal so that, um, next year could be really focused on that. All right. Uh, yes, ma'am. Right there. Cars can be on the street. Connect with the people who decide how big and dense the buildings can be. So far, living in Seattle, I haven't seen any kind of connection. I've seen a lot of fantasies about everyone will be on bicycles and tricycles and walking. Yeah. No one will actually run their own business and have to take an object from point A to point B because they all work nine to five. Entrepreneurs are different. So I've heard estimates as high as thirty to forty, maybe fifty thousand more people in the U district by the time all the towers are built. We have two micro bridges. I often am an hour each way in gridlock now. Is there any stopping point and who is in charge? Who is the connection between the density and the park? Um, that's 
EIS process, the environmental impact statement process, they examine the impacts of development on across several different factors. Um, and if a community doesn't gr agree with the results of that EIS, um, often the city will be sued and it will be resolved by the courts. As it relates specifically to the regulatory framework um, around uh, I wasn't sure if you were, when you were talking about cars in the street, are you talking about parking, are you talking about driving? Mm -hmm. Now we have two hour waits. We're at least here to be grandiose. Two and a half hour wait to get to a bridge. That's a little late for any IS in a lawsuit because it's, it's all completely out of your control by then. There's so many people on the street, all the parking's gone, so no one's actually going to the stores because they're at home ordering from Amazon. Yeah, the, the EIS process is, has lapsed at this point. The zoning is, is to be the, the, the stopping point, right? The, the zoning capacity of an area. Um, and as, as, you're, as you're pointing out, there are lots of different opinions um, about um, what the capacity of this city is. Um, you know, one of the things that you'll, you'll hear people say is that we can, we're required by the state to, um, uh, under the Growth Management Act, to do, um, to do planning to accept the number of people that, um, it, that they're, the PSRC, the Puget Sound Regional Council, makes an estimate of the number of people um, that are supposed to be moving to this region, and then we're required by the, uh, the Growth Management Act to actually plan to absorb um, that number of people, and um, the, the zoning is the tool that we use to, to plan. Um, and the, um, the argument is often made that we can, um, and if you, you look at the capacity models that the city uses, um, and so it's, it's borne out to be true, is that we can actually meet our, um, our obligations um, under the um, comp plan, the comprehensive plan, that's the document that we use to, to um, implement the growth goals for the city, um, that we already have the capacity to meet our growth goals without the increased zoning. So um, that then it becomes a question of um, are we, are we, what is the purpose of, of the increased zoning in the case of, of MHA? The purpose is to be able to extract from developers a, a commitment towards affordable housing. It's not about um, increasing the zoning so that we can accommodate all the people that are moving here. Right on. Um, sir, do you have an immediate response? Great, great. Exactly. Um, I commented on the University District EI zoning EIS on in saying exactly what she just said. The response to my comment was by OBCD that the zoning is there is no relationship between zoning and traffic. That's the one. That's what we're charged with doing. That was the, you, can go to, you can go to the EIS and read it. Okay. Any, uh, just shed a little bit of different perspective on that. Peter, 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 Peter don't oh, elaborate. Sorry, you, but, no, no, sorry. Um, but do you want to respond just specifically on that? Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead somewhat different perspective. I know from my own working experience, both at City Hall and as a consultant to the uh, planning department, that the, the love of cars and parking is no defense. <laughs> and that, in fact, in the EIS process, it, the mitigation is always alternative transportation, is tra transit, high, high capacity, bus, light rail, etc. And levels of service, which is the technical term for capacity limits to driving is really not considered a, a major factor anymore. We have all kinds of failing intersections in the city, and the city looks to mitigating that through in increased investment in transit and through their comprehensive plans around urban villages. So th that's how I would respond. And a perfect example is that no multifamily housing requires now to have off-street parking in the city. It's because we have transit. So, and that's going, and bicycle lanes and what have you. So, so um, before we uh, go into other questions, um, so does anyone who had their hand up have a question relating to small businesses? Uh, yes, sir, in the back. Yeah, so um, I recognize that there is a difference between the average zone, right? Um, 
right? And um, but in, you know, my correspondence with Thompson over Johnson, you know, made me made aware of a couple of facts, right? First of which is that I was already zoned for 65 feet, you know, you know, in his discussions with me, you know, and his staff. Um, and he, he told me that his intention is not to zone it beyond. Know, no, oh, sorry. His intention is that there is no desire for this office to zone beyond 75 feet, which is the minimum required to get MHA implemented on the app. Um, so, you know, I was just curious as to if there was, you know, a significant risk of redevelopment under a reason, why is that not the case, you know, presently, um, you know, given the fact that we are, you know, pretty close to the, um, you know, projected rezone heights? Uh, do oh, folks want to yeah. Um, so there, there's some truth to that and there's some lies to that. Uh, when they first projected uh, what they were trying to uh, grow uh, the Ave to, uh, they were talking about going to 160 feet south of 45th and, 85th, and 85 feet uh, north of 45th. Um, and it's due to, you know, essentially, you know, community pressure that we were trying to guide that to a more realistic number. Um, so I would say that you have some true information, some false information, um, as well as uh, a 75 feet increase, um, you know, to incite, you know, zoning, you know, that the, the, the judge is still out on the jury of what that would actually do to impact the area. Um, but what we've seen is every time that there has been up zones and there has been changes, uh, I mean, name one small business that you still go to in South Lake Union that was there before, you know, the Mercer mess. Um, you know, my favorite cheesemonger shop in the city was there and, you know, they're long gone. Anyway, so, um, and at what point do you, is, is there enough of zoning, right? And how, how could you justify uh, putting a whole bunch of small businesses at risk even further when you already have massive zoning changes in the area? Oh, where, where's the fact that you know Wallingford is 45th that is not you know on the same sort of um, you know on the same sort of considerations as the app? Yeah, and that's. That what Lisa Herbal is talking about, and that's uh, neighborhoods like you know, kind of centered zoning. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, certain neighborhoods can only hold so much capacity, and you have to really take into consideration um, as well as what you know those neighborhood tenants want um, and what those voters want. So that's that's ultimately what's important. Right. Any more business uh, focused questions? Yeah. With using property tax as a bargaining tool for uh, to allow landlords, either in old buildings or even a new building, to keep the rent lower for the rate that currently are being an option, something that could be uh, used. So currently, um, our ability to use property taxes as um, an incentive um, is really defined by state law. So the uh, MFTE program that was mentioned earlier, the multifamily tax exemption program that's authorized under state law. Similarly, the King County Assessor has some exemption programs uh, for seniors um, uh, um, who are low income to not pay property taxes. So all of that is really defined under state law. So if we were to create a, um, an incentive program for the owners of properties, um, who that house low-income businesses, we'd need to get that authority from the state first before we could enact something like that. But um, one of the things that we haven't really talked that much about is actually how you can use, you know, within the context of discussions around um, adding an additional, you know, 10 feet to a business district, how um, in, in the zoning capacity, how you can actually use um, zoning as a tool to make sure that the buildings that are um, that um, are built um, in cases in the cases of redevelopment actually have small um, small size uh, envelopes for small businesses to be able to rent. So you don't you're not you're not dealing with a, a retail floor that is um, designed in such a way to serve a single large business at a very very high rate, but to require um, uh, maximum uh, square foot 
square footage frontages of like 45 feet require um, spaces that are 2,000 square feet inside. Um, those are things that can be done to keep the keep the rents low um, and incentivize uh, uh, the developer of a of a property to to rent to small businesses. By the way, uh, before I pick uh, another hand from the crowd, does do any of the small business owners want to chime in on that or? Okay, groovy, groovy. Also, a little shout out for South Park, both transport and uh, quality of life as a former resident. Just saying. Anyway, um, yes, ma'am. Yeah. The cycle of development is just that, it's cyclical, right? Um, and so um, there is a question of whether or not um, not only um, whether or not development is going to slow, and it is very likely going to, to slow at some point, but then it'll very likely pick back up again. Um, the, the old saying is the booms create the busts, is I think it, it, as it relates to real estate development, um, a, an observable fact. Um, and you know, the, the vacancy rate does, it changes you know, by a percentage here and there. Um, you know, I would be pretty skeptical of the reports that you're hearing about um, reduced rents. Um, rents aren't really going down, they're just, they're, they're increasing at a slower rate. Mm -hmm. And also, they're, um, they're in those studies, they're looking also at move-in rebates that doesn't translate to a difference in a monthly rent, and it's only for people who are moving into, into buildings, not for the people who are actually already living in those buildings. Which, you know, for a city that's really struggling with being able to provide people with um, home ownership opportunities, um, that actually might be um, a good part of the cycle. Sir? Uh, thank you. Uh, I, over, the, over the decades, I've definitely written comments on the Master Plan for the University District. Uh, particularly for the University of Washington. Oh, wait, remember, we got to stay away from that. Okay. Uh, my comment is really related to the loss of open space. Um, that was the densification of the city with making more tunnel-like in the communities um, and the, the loss of not only the visual aesthetics of seeing more open space um, so that if there's a lawn there, at least if it's private, at least I can see this, this space. As we're having smaller and smaller sidewalks, um, if a business is trying to survive, if the app is trying to survive, if the university district is trying to survive, then how do we preserve it? How do we get more open space? And, and some of it might be maybe we can take some of this, can we take like the University Street, like it's closed for, um, for the farmer's market on Saturdays, maybe 
there could be some closures in some of the streets in some capacity to make them more walking, to, to have more open space. Now, how could we be creatively thinking if, you know, to, to have more open space because we're losing it. As we densify, we have more people moving in as we're saying, and they're building up. There's, we're not getting new parks. I remember the grand thing for up uh, in uh, Roosevelt, it was some lot that the mayor was saying people want to make this little lot into a park and said, no, we can't have pocket parks, we've got a, that could be some grandmother's apartment. And they fought over that for a while, and I think they might have finally given in a lot of people a park. But we shouldn't have to fight for every little square foot. We need to be, I mean, there be a formula. What formula can be made to give us more open space, more park space for people on the ground? No. Lisa's been getting all the hardball questions. <laughs> uh, um, uh, well, sure, I know. Well, thank you, Lisa, for your candor and all that. Don't worry, well, we have respect here. It's one okay. thing that Seattle does not do that every single jurisdiction in Western Washington does is developer fees. We don't have them here. Four parks, four mm -hmm. trans transportation, four community policing, uh, fire, et cetera, schools. That's how they fund things everywhere else. But here, no. We have put all of our, our chits in one basket, our, our what, how should I say, into the affordable housing as the top priority and uh, to tag on through a, a kind of a developer fee, but it's an incentive wink wink program uh, that's supposedly voluntary. But the city has, has studied, has made commitments, has set goals for concurrency with parks and open space. And it's in the comp plan, but it's not delivered on because we have gaps all over the city, many in the high density areas where more housing development and density is being promoted, but there's not the concurrent commitment to doing just what you say. Now we're looking at streets as because the city does own 40% of the land area through uh, the streets right of ways. And so there's some very creative ideas. I would encourage you to go to the uh, KUOW uh, piece this morning on urban mobility in the university district. It was uh, one of our uh, leaders here, Corey Crocker, was featured prominently. And he's been advocating for alternatives, just to what you're talking about, a pedestrian malls, transit, segregated, and so forth, to create more open space. So um, we have only a couple minutes left. So, and I should add that many of our panelists are going to be around uh, after the ending of the discussion. So if you, oh, I'm not even going to weigh into that comment right now here in a pro quasi professorial capacity. Anyway, I digress. Uh, so in that case, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So in that case, um, before we give our panel a round of applause, I just want to see if each of you wants to give about 30 seconds, just like a closing statement or any closing thoughts for just 30 seconds really quick. Anyone? Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Well, we uh, can continue this party, but not necessarily here. I was told the cutoff point is 8.45. So wait, 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 wait. I, I, know, I know, don't worry, we'll get to it. But um, just want to make sure that we respect the space that we're in. Big shout out to University Methodist Church, which, by the way, is also facing displacement. So any closing comments? No? OK. Awesome. Well, in that case, uh, please feel free to come up and ask our panel questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right yeah. Just a guy. <laughs> <laughs>